Good morning, Good morning everybody. I'm, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, as you can tell, I don't do a lot of webinars. Um, it's kind of a strange experience for me because I kind of like gauging what the audience is doing, and I don't know if there are six of you in the audience or a couple thousand, and I don't know if you're rolling your eyes back in your head or whether your eyes are completely closed. Um, but on the other hand, I'm sitting in a hotel room in the D.C. area in my pajamas and bunny slippers, so it works both ways. So we're going to talk, uh, you know, when we were uh, setting up this uh, this seminar, we thought it might be useful for those of you who aren't oil geeks, like many of us, to, to really um, provide a little context and background for what we're going to be talking about and to try to explain why oil is difficult both to respond to and uh, as well as to study in um, scientific uh, investigations. So, um, so we're starting very basic, and I hope I'm not patronizing some of you, but um, here we go. So. Oil, petroleum, it, of course, is naturally occurring. You in the Gulf of Mexico know this better than um, almost uh, anybody else in the country. Um, and it's a, a mix of, uh, of uh, gaseous and liquid and solid materials. Um, and maybe the most important thing to consider when we talk today is that it's a really complex mixture of um, thousands of different types of chemicals. Uh, and of course, we use that oil to, to make a lot of the stuff that we use um, in, in everyday life. So you're probably wondering what this is. It's uh, my cultural reference here. Uh, some of you may be too young to even know what this is, but for uh, those of us of a certain age, um, this uh, conjures up fond memories. And the reason that I'm showing it is that um, the, this is, of course, is the Beverly Hillbillies. And, Jed Clampett was known for um, going out shooting at some food um, up from the ground, come a bubbling crude. And, um, it, you know, that's very simplistic. Uh, it's just to remind people that oil is a natural material. It does come up in natural seeps. And, in fact, um, the lower right here shows you a natural seep in the Ojai oil fields in uh, California after the uh, Northridge earthquake. It just started bubbling up from the ground. So. We have these seeps all over, um, both on land and in the ocean. Um, this is a uh, slide from a National Academy of Sciences report that just shows the, the amount of oil that goes into American waters from natural seeps, and it's a pretty substantial amount. 63% of the um, oil that goes into our water comes from seeps. On the left-hand side, you see a, a seep off the coast of California. Um, that's a picture I took um, off Santa Barbara. And there's a, a, a lot of oil that comes up uh, onto the surface of the water. And uh, the lower left, if you go up into the hills above Santa Barbara, even in the freshwater streams, you see oil seeping in there. So, you know, the point is is that um, oil is, is a natural product. Um, uh, again, in California, this is um, Platform Holly, one of the production platforms in the Santa Barbara Channel, and you see oil trailing off there from left to right, and that actually is not from the platform. It's from the seat that's located very close to Platform Holly. Um, so, you know, we started off saying that oil is a complex mixture, and this is just a simple pie diagram that shows um, some of the compounds, the, the constituents that are in crude oil. and. We'll see if this works. Um, this is uh, another way to show it. It's a, uh, an animation that um, basically shows the same things, but for those of you who are a little bit more into chemistry, it shows you the, the chemical structure of um, some of the major constituents. Um, so we see alkanes uh, comprising about 30% of crude oil. Alkanes are simple straight chain hydrocarbons. Naphthenes um, are also called, called cyclohexanes. Uh, they're about 50% of uh, crude oil. Aromatics, we often talk, you'll be hearing, uh, I think, a lot about aromatic hydrocarbons, 15%. These are um, compounds with benzene rings. The, you see the ring structures here. And then asphaltines, about 5%. These are the real heavy compounds in crude oil, very complex. 
Um, hard to define compounds, but it's really kind of the dregs of what's left uh, in a barrel of oil after everything else is taken out. So here's a summary again of um, uh, what's in a barrel of oil. And I think the takeaway is that it's, it's a complex mixture. So just keep that in mind, and we basically have to take into account all the time what's what's in oil when we are responding to it or trying to study it. So um, those of you in uh, the Gulf may be uh, familiar with the terms on the left from light sweet crude to heavy sour crude. And I won't get into what all of those things mean, but I think, again, the takeaway is that these different kinds of crudes have different um, mixes of the constituents in them. And, um, the value of each crude is really dependent on um, what's in that oil. So the light sweet crudes are often highly valued because we get the things that we really like, like gasoline and uh, other fuels like diesel and jet fuel. So we separate out the constituents, the, the different types of uh, products in crude oil by um, refining it, and that's basically a distillation process. So the crude oil is heated up, and the different um, parts of the crude oil come off of that crude oil mixture at different temperatures. So at lower temperatures, you see the very light materials like gasoline um, and kerosene come off first, and then uh, at very high temperatures, you get really uh, what's left, uh, things like asphalt and paraffins. This is pretty similar to, you know, what the old uh, revenuers used to do the, or the um, moonshiners uh, do in uh, some parts of the country and have done for a long time, um, distilling uh, grain alcohol from uh, mixtures. And in some parts of the world, there are even um, petroleum equivalents. Uh, this is a shot from Nigeria showing a what's called an artisanal refinery, uh, refinery operation. Um, folks uh, hijack or steal oil in Nigeria and then refine it to get the high-value products out of it, which um, sounds a, a little quaint, but um, it, it's a very messy process. So Nigeria has a number of problems, but the, uh, the holding, the residual from doing this uh, so-called artisanal refinery are pretty substantial in terms of environmental effects. All right, so I'm going to blast through basic oil properties, and these are things that we think about in response and how we deal with an oil spill. So that's what I'm emphasizing here, but you see three basic physical properties, um, density, pore point, and viscosity. And so density is, um, I, I think it's intuitive for many of us. It's um, basically, will it float on, on water or will it not? And um, uh, there are two ways to think about density, and one is uh, thinking about it in terms of specific gravity, and uh, uh, it's based uh, on a comparison to pure water. So uh, basically anything uh, with a uh, specific gravity or density less than one will float on fresh water. Anything greater than one will tend to sink. Now, in the oil business, we uh, use something called API gravity, which is also based on the density of pure water, but it's a way to sort of standardize it to temperature and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, the simplest way to think about it is that in an API uh, density or gravity, um, anything greater than 10 is lighter than water. Anything less than 10 is um, denser than water. So, you know, this sounds pretty, pretty esoteric, like esoteric stuff, but when you get into um, oil spill response, we really need to think about density and specific gravity. And here's an example. Um, there, a lot of the uh, late news about um, so-called uh, emerging risk oils uh, have to do with Alberta bitumen coming from Canada. It's a very heavy product. And one of the primary questions in, in deciding whether to allow this stuff to go through in pipelines is whether it'll sink or not. And um, during testimony to the uh, Canadian Energy Board, um, a lot of the industry folks um, pointed out that uh, when they mix up the stuff that's transported in um, pipelines, it's, it's basically like any other crude oil. So this is a guy that, that uh, I, I've um, worked with since Exxon Valdez, Al Mackey, and he testified to the board that uh, 
They simply cannot sink, and, and that's an important uh, consideration. However, um, other reports, in fact, this one was from the Canadian government, um, said that, well, that's not necessarily the case. If you mix it with sediment in the water, it can sink. So um, specific gravity and density is an important consideration for response and for uh, potential environmental effects. Um, again, pore point uh, is another physical property. It's basically at what temperature will the stuff, um, the oil product, pour freely. So you see on the left a fluid material at a certain temperature and on the right a uh, uh, less fluid one. It takes uh, a higher temperature to get it to flow like the one on the left. Um, an example from response, this is a shot from Spain, the Prestige spill, and it's an aerial photo of a bedrock shoreline. So you see heavy oiling there. This is from a tanker that went down off the coast of Spain. Um, what was interesting was that it occurred in November and December, and uh, it, the temperature, ambient temperature, was below the pore point of the oil. And so as it came ashore on this bedrock shoreline, it was pretty easy to clean up. You can see um, some Spanish soldiers simply shoveling the stuff up, and it, it kind of rolled up almost like a carpet. Um, it was below the pore point, so it didn't, it wasn't fluid, it didn't adhere. So viscosity is just a tendency of an oil to spread. We think about this a lot in terms of how it behaves both on the water and on the shoreline. Um, just some examples of how we measure uh, viscosity. Um, lower numbers are more fluid and higher numbers are more like solids. So you kind of have some simple examples here and you see some oils on the right-hand side. Okay. and. Um, You'll hear people talk about groups one through five oils, and these are kind of hard to define. I tried to get some numbers on how to define different groups, but I think maybe the most informative way to think about these things are simply the descriptions that are there on the left-hand side. So group one oils are very light oils. Um, group five are very heavy, and in fact, group five oils are sinkers. So that's probably the easiest, uh, most intuitive way to think about groups one through five. Um, and the only reason I bring it up is that we have some, uh, we have a general a rule of thumb about how these oils behave and how toxic they are. And what you're going to hear today is really some uh, cutting edge information on a new way to think about oil toxicity. So, you know, you look at um, this table of impacts to uh, different kinds of aquatic organisms across uh, groups one through four oils. And this is the way we thought about toxicity for a long time. But the folks who are going to be talking to you after I finally shut up um, are going to uh, demonstrate some new ways to think about oil toxicity. And maybe um, they're going to show you that this paradigm that I have up here is not necessarily very good. Oil weathering, and I'm not going to spend any time on this, but the takeaway here is that when you put oil into the environment, it changes. It's like a chameleon. It's changing all the time. So it really affects um, how you deal with it in the environment and what the potential environmental effects are going to be. So um, again, I don't have much time to dwell on this slide, but um, going through those basic oil weathering mechanisms, it, it, they're just some, some highlights about what we think about when uh, oil does spill. But um, in, in general, uh, just keep in mind that the oil that spills initially is going to be very, very different from what the oil looks like after even a day or um, a week or certainly after a month. So it's always changing and it really changes how we think about it both in terms of response and environmental impact. Finally, I'm just going to mention dispersants. I'm sure, you know, I know that dispersants are kind of on the radar for a lot of you. Um, th these are just some factoids about dispersants. Uh, um, they're another complex mix of materials, um, probably less complex than oil itself. And there's been a concerted effort to try to reduce toxicity over the years, but they're still really controversial. And you in the Gulf know this better than anybody. Um, just to show how dispersants work, on the left is um, some South Louisiana crude that's been mixed with seawater, shaken up for a little bit, 
And on the right, it's the same mix, but it was a little bit of Corexit 9500 in it. And you can see um, how much more oil is in the water on the right-hand side. And finally, um, this is just a list of what's in Corexit. Uh, um, and to, I guess, demonstrate that these are not completely exotic. They're not necessarily things you want to add willy-nilly to the environment, but um, they're, they're you know, commonly used in a lot of different consumer products. So something to keep in mind, um, I, I know we'll be talking about dispersants for a long, long time, and we and know are going to be doing that uh, in a structured way, trying to understand what we know and what we don't know. But in any event, I think that's all I've got. I just wanted to give you a quick overview, and so um, I hope that was not too quick. I hope you're still awake even after the morning coffee, and uh, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more later on if you have any questions. Thanks.